Good morning and welcome to Life, Love and the Pursuit of Real Estate. I'm here with my friend, James Hadsolis. Hey, Michael. James is a very, very um, humble individual. He's currently unemployed, <laughs> deservedly so, I think. Or some uh, say temporarily retired. <laughs> temporarily retired. Mm -hmm. So James has got a very, very good history uh, of real estate. And what I thought I'd do is for uh, all you up and comers in the real estate industry, James has uh, kindly donated some time with me this morning just to talk about what he did, how he went about it, who he's worked for, etc. cetera. Um, and I will, so uh, first of all, welcome, James. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks for coming. Um, and I think I'm sure a lot of people get a lot out of this morning. Mm -hmm. So to start off, just let's, let's do a critique on, on, a, on a bit of you. So how old are you? 46, just turned 46. Married, kids? Married, two beautiful daughters. Okay, great. All right, how long have you been married? Uh, 14 years. Okay, and you live in Manningham? Yeah. You live in Manningham, yeah. okay. All right, James has just finished at uh, Barry Plant, and uh, when did you leave Plants? Uh, end of 2014. End of 2014, okay. And like, like you, I came from Plants as well, and I've got to say the, the, uh, the, birth, the birthing of real estate in that business was great for me, hasn't yeah. it? You found that too? 100%. Yeah, yeah, very good. Good organisation. Yeah. All right, so tell, just run us through when you started in real estate, what year you started, who you started with, mm -hmm. and just give us a quick lineage yeah, sure. of what you've done. Uh, in the 30-second version, I yeah. ended up starting my career working for a company called Blackburn Lockwood Commercial. I had a friend of mine who gave me an opportunity to meet the owner of the business back then. Um, I was 19, I looked 12. Um, <laughs> the, the market back then was pretty tough, so uh, I had no experience, but uh, when I went for the interview, um, the guy said to me, look, I can't offer you a position. I said, I'm happy to work for nothing. Just give me an opportunity. And uh, he was taken back by that, so he did. Uh, I did that for a year. I mean, I got paid a few hundred bucks here or there but it was essentially for nothing. Um, the word started to spread that you know, back then, who's a young guy working for nothing through networks that I knew. Um, I applied for a job then for a company called EJ Doherty um, in the northern suburbs in Preston. Now they uh, made it with plants later on, didn't they? They did, yeah, yeah they did. So um, I got my first job as a, an, an official property manager for AJ Doherty in, in Preston. Great. Okay. Reservoir, did it for four and a half years. Well, that's a hard gig. Very hard gig, yeah. you know, collecting rents and, yeah. and, and seeing- Especially that in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was a bit yeah. of a culture shock <laughs> <laughs> into, into the northern suburbs from the eastern suburbs. Yeah. But it was good, it was good. It was a great, great learning ground. Uh, and then I met Barry, who built my auntie's house in Bourne at a family wedding. Okay, And we Beautiful. started talking, uh, and on a handshake, I was nervous as a young guy there, just trying to meet the you know, Barry plant, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then uh, on a handshake agreement, um, I asked Barry for a contractual agreement, said to me, son, my handshake's my word. And true to his word, in, in 24 years, I've never signed an employment agreement. So I joined Barry, uh, started off as a cadet. I was willing to do anything to get under his wing. Um, worked as a property manager as well. Uh, built his rent roll up quite significantly in that sort of 12 to 18 month period. Yeah, good. Put me into sales. Then I became the sales manager. And then I took over the business in 2009 and here we are today. Okay, well let's, let's talk about that takeover yep. of the business. So you were working in that business and yep. the opportunity came up to buy it. Yep. So did you, did you go into partnership with the current director or did you gain a new partner and start up a new directorship? Well, when Barry was running it, he said to me um, what my goal was. I said to him back from day one that I wanted to take over the business one day. And he said, if you prove yourself, that opportunity will be there. I became a sales manager prior to uh, buying the business right. uh, for about two and a half years, three yep. years. And then in 2009, I took it over with a guy that was currently working there. Um, so he focused on his sales career whilst I was managing the business. And then in 2009, we came together and took over the business um, and it started to go up from there. Right, okay. Um, so on, on that, and we'll cover that in a, in a bit of detail because I, I want to get into the, the, uh, the core or, the, or the, the duck's ass details for the one of a better term of the business yeah. and what made you successful. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about in that when you took over that transition from sales manager to director yeah how did you find that transition um <clears throat> personally i found it the only part that i found daunting is that now you are in total control of the ship yeah whereas before when i was working under barry's wing you have that security blanket knowing that barry's there yeah. um, but i knew in myself that i had the ability to run the business so it felt as though, it's almost like flying a plane, you know, I'm sure, not that I've ever flown a plane, but you can almost imagine a, a pilot, a junior pilot going on his maiden voyage. Now, without the teacher, you are now flying on your own. Yeah. You are now in control of this ship. And I guess when you're in that situation, when you, 
you have to uh, believe in yourself and, and understand that whatever it is you're going to do now, the, the, the responsibility falls back on your shoulders. I knew I had the ability to do it. So that transition being a sales manager to being a business owner, for me, it just, it, it just flowed naturally. That was the only, I guess, self-doubt that I had was, you know, I'm now on my own to do this with a partner, of course, but we knew we had the ability to do it. All right, okay. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick story, and I don't know if I've told you this, about when, when I bought my first real estate office, mm. I actually bought with two friends of mine. Yeah. So we bought two offices at the time. Yeah. Right? We were looking at one and ended up buying two. Well, within a very short period of time, and I'm talking months, both partners had left me. Right. So I sort of left wow. holding the bag. Yeah. And the realization came, I felt like the pilot in the plane by himself. Yeah. And I sat there one night and Johnny Walker and I became friends, right? And I was trying to map out what I was going to do and, and work it all out. And that feeling of isolation or fear actually got me motivated. Yeah, 100%. Do you find that? 100%. Yeah. 100%. I think it's like, I think it's any situation when you know that, when you know you're in the ring, failure isn't an option. Yeah. When you know right now you've got to rely on all your abilities, your skill sets and so forth. But I think there's a part of that that just comes naturally. I mean, I loved leading. Yeah. Not from an egotistical point of view. Yeah. I genuinely love helping people. Oh, it's good taking people on a journey. 100%. Yeah. You know, and I had a vision. I remember, I remember saying to um, a group of managers one day when um, I was asked to go in a bit of a chat at a, at a manager's meeting. And they said to me, James, where do you see this business going? And I actually said back then, I want to turn this business into a $10 million business. Keeping in mind the average Barry Plant office is doing under two million bucks. Right. And when I said that, you could always hear a pin drop in the room. But I did it deliberately. Yeah. Because I, I genuinely believed that this business will, will get there. It's possible. The vision was as clear as daylight. Yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't matter what everybody else thought. I knew where I wanted to go. And you look back now, when I sold the business, it did just under eight million dollars. So we're well and truly on our way to doing that. Right, okay. The Congratulations. Power, oh, yeah, thank good. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this then. In so Bef well, let's go to the point at the end when yeah. you sold. Yeah. Tell me, give me a rough structure of the office. How many? How many did you have in PM? How many in admin? How many in sales, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we know you roughly did about eight million bucks. Yep. So let's work it back. Yep. And let's have a look. So just there was about okay in in um, all up part time full time was about fifty five odd staff. Right. Both full time part time. We had uh, about for memory about sixteen salespeople plus support crew, yep. PAs and whatnot. Uh, in PM, we had five PMs, um, so there's about eight people in the, in the PM department, right. yeah, including Andy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, about 15, 16 in sales, uh, and then all support crew, admin staff, you know, bookkeepers and marketing and okay. PAs to myself and my business partner then. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a decent sized team. Okay. And in the time that, that, from the time that you took over to the time that you sold, one of the things, since, as you know, I've been doing a, quite a bit of consultancy work. Yeah. So I've actually seen real estate from in 02 when I left to coming back into it in the last year or so. And I've been training people in Perth and in other states and here in Melbourne. Yeah. What I find is this, there is a very big shift in mentality of principles in what they're prepared to do and not prepared to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's funny, sometimes, you know, people say, Jeez, I hope I don't become like my parents yep. or like my father. I'm actually becoming like my father. I'm, kind of think, I'm now thinking very much like him. Yep. He's always said to me, you need to lead from the front and you need to be able to do everything everyone else can do in the business so then you can critique it properly when it's been done wrong. Mm. And I thought that's very logical. Mm. And at 54 years of age now, I look at that and go, that was great advice. And inadvertently, even though I didn't agree with it at the time, I took it on. Yeah. Right. Yep. So what, my question is, is that over that period of time, I see that directors now are more hands-on in relation to listing and selling. Yep. I believe the reason for that is the, the bottom line, the yep. P&L. Yep. Right? And I also believe that the, there's been a shift in commissions slightly upwards. Mm -hmm. My thought process, and I'll get to my question in a sec, but my thought process is that it's very hard to lead a successful team when you're doing that amount of work. 100%. So therefore, I still go back to the strategy of... I would be still happy if I was running an office to list and sell to a minor degree. I'd be happy to make sure that all our clients got to meet me as the owner. Right? But I'm finding that the, the business, from that point of view, when the director is so heavily involved in the listing and selling, it fragments. Yep. I don't believe it can run and be as successful and still gain momentum 
over the period of its journey yep. if the director is not controlling the journey and they can't control the journey when they're working in the business day to day. Do you agree with that? 150%. So tell me what you did. Okay, look, I've got a very simplistic outlook on life and in business. So I guess my mentors in life have taught me that in, uh, to, to keep things simple. Yeah. And I used to say to people all the time, you, it's a bit like a captain of a plane. A captain of a plane cannot make, can't keep that, that plane steady if he's flying, if he's going in the back cabin crew, telling the cabin how to serve drinks, how to serve meals, cleaning the toilets, making sure that everything's happening yeah. behind the scenes. He has to focus on flying the plane. But occasionally he can put on autopilot, step at the back and make sure things are okay. See his customers, see his clients, make sure things are okay, introduce himself if he has to do that. Good analogy. To give that, to yeah. give up, no, to give that a customer service experience. Yeah. So for me, it was always about making sure that my team at the time knew that their leader was behind them. In other words, I said to Barry from day one, I don't believe a director need or has to be out there listing and selling real estate 24 seven competing with his staff. I, I gave him- I agree a, with that. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. But, but I said to him also that, let's have an experiment here. Let me step away from full-time sales. I'll mentor, guide, coach the team, call it what you like. I'll list when my clients call me, but I wanna be there to nurture the team. That was really a real turning point for the business because then the staff knew yep. that I was no longer competing with them and I don't care what anybody says when you're listing and selling real estate and I'm not trying to tell people what to do in their businesses this is what worked for us and for myself the business started to turn around quite dramatically once I stepped away from competing against the staff because when I was a sales manager and I say come and tell me your situation or problems they're thinking well what's in it for him that can be the mindset for some people but when you step away and become their mentor their leader their coach, call it what you like, all of a sudden they know that you're working with them, not against them. That's yeah. the mentality some sales people do have. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think when, you know, I, I get asked often mm. about my, my, the business that I sold in 02, mm. and we had 70, a 67% market share when I sold it, mm. and there were a lot of agents here. Yeah. And people go, oh, that was remarkable, I don't know if it could be done again now, et cetera, et cetera. And I always question that and I say, you know, but they're running their businesses differently. And I, I, I agree with that. There can only be one driver of the train, as mm. my normal used to say. <clears throat> and the reality of that is, is, is that when people feel like that you're invested in them, not just financially, but emotionally, and you're giving them the time and training them, and you're, you're, you're going to go out with a listing and help them and make sure that the office generates enough commission to keep it profitable, and that's where the training of getting the right fees comes in. Because as the fees drop, the directors have had to get more involved in the business. Correct. And that's been the first thing that's happened where the directors go, you know, the P&L doesn't show good GP, I've got to get in and list and sell. So therefore you are starting to compete. That creates a whole different mentality. Absolutely. I agree with that. So the goal is, if you're going to be a director of a business, the one point I get out of this discussion right now is the fact that you have to lead and that you have to give it back initially and maybe then gain profit later on. Absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, let's go to another part then. Yeah. When in um, one of the things with good real estate people is, is that they go through transitions and yep. they, they generally do them successful. Not every transition is successful, but the art to the deal is transitioning from one business to another, to another, to another. Because We've got a very short attention span as real estate agents, yeah, yeah. so we like to be entertained a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and my wife always always laughs about she's got the attention span of an ant <laughs> unless it comes to real estate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, on that score, one of the things in the transition things, you're now in transition mode. Mm -hmm. So, tell me right now what you're doing mm. to keep yourself invigorated day to day. Uh, both in and out of business. Whatever. Whatever. Um, first and foremost, looking after my health. More yep. importantly. So I'm training a fair bit, going to the gym, running, keep my mind active, so healthy lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's given me time to focus on me for a change for 12 months. And this, mind you, this is the first time in 24 years I've had total disconnect. And I don't call holidays being disconnected because your mind's still ticking over things exactly that's happening right. back home, yeah? yeah? So to be totally disconnected uh, has allowed me to focus on me. It's allowed me to focus on my kids, my wife, my family life. It's also given an opportunity to reflect back on an industry that I believe is changing quite rapidly. And you can't do that when you're on the treadmill, when you're running, 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 or if you're in the, in the frame, you can't see the whole picture, as we say. Yep. So stepping aside from that, it's given me the opportunity to see all that. Um, 
So I'm keeping myself active in terms of health. I'm also coaching and consulting around Melbourne. Um, it's something that I've always loved to do. Um, it, it gave me an opportunity to build my own website, uh, which I never had the, the time great. to do. Yeah, great. Um, it's I didn't, good too. Well, I didn't realise how much time, thank you. I didn't realise how much time it took yeah. to do that. Um, so that's been quite good. So I, I've actually enjoyed going back out into the industry and helping people uh, understand what it takes to be a good leader, um, how to build great cultures, um, value alignment, yeah. things that you learn along the journey yeah. that so many people haven't had the opportunity to surround themselves with the right mentors and, and coaches in life to teach them these things that I've learned over the period of time. And I'm still learning. Yeah, as, as we both are yeah. and as everyone else is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's talk about this. You, you mentioned the word disconnect, yeah. right? That disconnect, I've, I've, one of the things I've been preaching on this YouTube channel is that you need dormant time, you need time to rest. Mm. And aside from sleep, I class sleep as sleep, I don't class sleep as rest. Yep. I, I think they're two different things. You need good food and a bit yep. of exercise and all that sort of stuff. I get all that. But the disconnect part is very good for in here mm. because it's, the mind needs to be dormant to regenerate. You 100%. agree with that? 100%. Okay, all right. And then what I found is this, is, is that one of, the, one of the negatives that I've seen since I've been back into the training real estate agents is people get very disappointed with the delivery of service. So therefore, a delivery expectation of a client could be here, the delivery actually provided is here, mm. and neither will meet. And what I find by that is, I'm talking to a lot of real estate people that are actually mentally exhausted, mm. not just physically exhausted, but they, they, they never ever get that disconnect period yep. where they can, oh, yeah. I'm, just, I'm going to relax for a little while, and I'm going to take it easy because the, the brain needs to be dormant. So, you know, a good lesson would be for every, anyone watching today would be that if you're in the real estate industry, you do need to take consistent breaks. Yep, very right? much so. Yep, and towards the end, my, my personal development coach, Dr. Fred, is very big on us taking holidays and breaks. Yep. And one of the things I find with that is this, is that, you know, over the period of year, I generally now take somewhere between eight and 12 weeks off a year. Good on you. Right? It keeps me fresh. Yeah, it keeps me yeah. buzzing, and I'm on. Yeah, and I can talk to guys like you. Or every time you and I have a chat, it's always jovial. But we're on point. Yeah, right. And that's because we're both and rested. high energy. Yeah, and yeah. we're both rested. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'd like to think I'm normally like that, but I think I'm better with that now as I've matured. And then you know that you know you're not going to stay till two o'clock in the morning having a drink because no. you just know tomorrow it's going to be our rest. It's no good for you. Yeah. Right. So on. But the sad thing I've found so far is the delivery expectation of the clients is not being met yep right so and i've sort of i've changed tact just in this last couple of sentences but so let me bring you back to the barry plant before you sold up at manningham to do eight million bucks the delivery service to the client must be pretty high yeah so did you have customer service managers did you so did you have anyone away from the listing agent servicing the vendor or the buyer um well we, we worked in pods so there was always going to be like an EBU. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. So I think the listing agents would always focus on their strengths. I think the listing agent also never forgot that they had to have that face-to-face -face relationship with their client. Yeah. Um, their support crew gave them the opportunity and the time to do that. Um, so we always focused on customer service. That was that was priority for us. So uh, did you have one individual like when, when I had my business, we had one one lady who was extremely good and proficient that would ring every vendor no. after we listed the properties. You no. never had that? No, never had that. Right, okay. Um, actually, we, we, did, we did have one girl a while ago that did do that, but she, had, she moved on um, for personal reasons. But we found that most EBUs would focus on the customer service, their own little customer service experience. So we would always encourage the staff to you know, remember to give the client a world-class experience. Yeah. Um, but I think, in, in fairness to the industry too, sometimes you can meet clients whose expectations are, you know, well and truly above what you can honestly deliver. Yes. Um, because you don't know what the real circumstances are behind the scenes. But eight times out of ten, I can comfortably say that we delivered a high level of customer service. All right. Okay, that's great. I'd agree with you on that because I've heard a lot of good reports about that business. Mm. One of the let's. I want to get back to the directors working and competing with the staff. Yeah. All right. This is a very touchy subject for a lot of people, so sure. I'm going over it again, so I apologise to anybody who's listening and doesn't like what I'm saying. When, because training, I believe, is so important, and the delivery of service is so important, and I believe it's dwindled a little bit, mm. 
when the director is working the business, they can't train the staff. Yep. And generally speaking, the directors are proficient listers, proficient auctioneers, proficient office managers, etc. Mm. Right? So they've got some credo. On that score, when I look back and I look at and going back to the model that you and I run our offices on, right? And I wasn't fully aware of that until we had this this talk right now. But I ran my office that way. I wouldn't compete. And I, I made sure that it, I, I'd go in on what I call the hardball gets. Mm. If we had a listing that was tough to get, I'd go in with whoever it might be going in on the listing. And they'd call me in as a backup or I'd go in on the second or third visit, whatever it might be. Mm. So I'd do that. And that's what I saw my role as. Um, and then that would also give us some training material for our next sales meeting yeah. that I could say, this vendor was particularly hard. We got them over the line. This is what we did. Mm. There's some scripts, but we worked on sincerity. We worked on emotion. We worked on like-mindedness, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. So on that score, the the offices now, and I, I find because there's more real estate offices opening up than I've ever seen, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm amazed at how many. We've now got Sydney-based agents moving into Melbourne. We've got American-based agents now looking to move into Melbourne and Sydney. It, it, that That's going to um, go to another level. Yeah. And I think what happens is, is that the cost burden of running a real estate business in the, in the 14 years that I was out of it has gone up by 3x. Mm. I am absolutely mind boggled yeah. at the cost base, even from the point of view of these agent referral networks sure. where they want to hit you for 20 or 30% yeah. to give you a referral for a market appraisal, yep. right? Aside from me thinking that's absolute rubbish, mm. right? The reality <laughs> of that is, is, is that these people are coming in, they're running their, they're running their businesses from a garage, yep. right? Uh, and then when the agent is not making enough GP, your service level drops. Mm-hmm. So it's like a it's like a wheel of life. Yep. It comes around, so it's dropping. So therefore, because if not everyone's feeding and eating the same food or eating off the same plate, then you get disjointedness and the delivery service starts to drop. Yep. So what, what we did when I had my business is that we had a customer service manager that would ring every vendor as soon as, as, soon as the uh, property was listed. Mm-hmm. And they and that person was a backup to the listing agent, and she might ring and say, "Right, we've got the house open for the weekend. We're getting prepped, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And this is the routine. They say, "Oh, look, Michael's been over that already." Yep, no worries. I'm here as a backup. If there's anything you're really not happy with, you can ring me straight away. I'm always in the office. I'm always available, and I can get onto it quicker than the listing agent can as a backup. We just wanted to offer a, a, an extra service. What we found in the end is that that individual was starting to bring more referrals into the office. Mm than the listing agents were. Yep. Because they were getting recommended by other people yeah. saying, gee, this, this girl here has been fantastic that works for Michael, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Now, so my question is this, is that if you started up a real estate business today, right, whether it be James Hatzolis, whatever it might be, yep. Realty, whatever it might be, or ABC Real Estate, would you set it up the same as what you had before and if you don't set it up the same or wouldn't set it up the same, what would you do different? <laughs> uh, great question. Um, I think, uh, let me answer that in a, in a couple of parts. The first thing is um, what I had back then, um, I, I think the industry has been fairly untouched for 30, 40, 30 to 40 odd years, meaning it's been isolated, it's been run the same way for a, a number of years. I think going forward, the game is changing. And like any business, um, like any industry, if you don't evolve with the demands of consumers, with... Um, That's delivery expectation. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But even the cost of running those operations is changing. I mean, even the car industry is changing. You look at you know, Ferrari, for example, even they've had to refine their engines because times are changing, right? The way people build houses today is different to the way they built them 20 years ago. That's yeah. changing. Yeah. So every industry has to evolve. And as, as, as John would tell you, McGraw would say to you, if you, if you don't like change, you're gonna hate extinction even worse. <laughs> so, you know, so we yeah, have to yeah, change. Yeah, yeah. So what would I do differently? I think um, the day uh, these massive offices, if they don't start watching their costs, because margins are getting smaller, competition's getting heavier. Um, if you don't start watching your costs, that can, I believe that will catch up with you fairly, fairly quickly. So I think you don't know, you no longer need um, I believe, uh, high cost businesses. It's all about efficiency going forward. Yes. And your definition of efficiency can be different to everybody else's. Absolutely. This time for me, being, uh, I guess, detached from the business has allowed me to reflect back on the business and say, okay, well, how would I do it differently? 
Um, I don't think I'd ever want to be, you know, paying ridiculous amounts of rents anymore. Um, I don't think I need 600 square metres of office space anymore. Yeah. Um, I don't think I need 60 staff anymore. Um, I think today is about low cost, high profit, yeah. um, and offering world-class service. It's hard to do that, I believe, when you're, when you're looking after 60, 70, 80, 90 people. But when you offer a boutique service, uh, a bit like a boutique hotel, a boutique restaurant, um, if you can control the environment you're in and have total team alignment, and they can all subscribe to your vision, I think that in itself can give the big boys, if you like, a big run for their money. And I have having, to agree with you 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just do it, I'll do it smarter. Yeah. And I think, as I said to you, the quick chat we had before this interview, well, I said to you, you know, when you asked me, what would you do if you were going to restart? If I was going to restart a real estate office, not that I'm thinking of that, but if I was going to, I would have um, a limited number of properties that I'd take on yeah. with a limited number of staff. Yeah. And I'd make sure our journey was good. And I think if you are good enough and you offer good service and people know they're going to be serviced properly. What I find, actually, I'll deviate for a sec. With a vendor, if a vendor firmly believes that you've got the best price you can possibly get, they will sell the property. Absolutely. But when the trust is broken, and that's generally due to lack of service, when the trust is broken, then they won't. And they're always circumspect about taking the offer that you provide them. Correct. And even if it's the best offer in the marketplace, they're not certain of that and they won't take that. So therefore, I'm sort of abiding by the adage that less is more. Yeah. And you know, when how many listings can an office handle at one time? That depends on a whole range of different things. But one of the things that I'm sort of starting to learn and starting to re-believe, so to speak, if I start an office today, I might have a receptionist, I might have someone, and the receptionist would probably do some of the marketing as well and maybe a part-time backup for that. Yep. And I might have one or two salespeople, and that might be it, mm. right? But yep. then we don't handle any more than say five, six, seven, eight listings at any one time, we take it on. And if you're good enough, you know what will happen? People will queue up to list. Yeah, 100%. As you sell them, they will queue up. Because when the service level is fantastic, shit hot, yeah. people will come to you. And yeah. one of the, one of the lovely things since I've been sort of retired out of real estate, as I said to you before, I'm getting people coming up to me in a whole range of other suburbs going, thanks very much for selling my house, Michael. That was 15 years ago. I said, we still remember that experience. Yeah. That's lovely that that happens. Yeah. So therefore, the goal is to emulate that. So, if, so therefore, there's a lot of, you would get away from the big business of real estate and mm. get into more the service orientated boutique type stuff. Yeah, I think there's, there's plenty of examples like that out there as we speak. I mean, you take the, you know, for example, the Florentinos of this world. If yeah. you want to go to extreme and, and fine dining, Guy Grossi doesn't need to have, you know, a massive restaurant. He, he delivers a quality product. Yeah, and people always. Talk, always, and people yeah. talk about it. Um, you know, you can take any boutique hotel. You don't need to be up against the crowns of this world. If you offer a great service, people will talk. And yeah. people want to be, people want to feel special. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you go to, I was, I was down at, uh, I've got a mate of mine that works at, um, if I can use this as an example, he, he, he runs Rolls Royce in Melbourne. Oh yeah? Now, it's a top end product, I get that. But let me tell you, they don't sell anywhere near the volume that say for example, no. a, a, a Ford or a Mercedes or Volvo or whatever do. But when you walk in there, gee, they'll make you feel special. And I think, forget the, forget the make for a moment. It was how I was made to feel. And I think people will forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Exactly right. Yeah, no I matter what that. you do. That was one of the first things I learned in this business. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that experience, is, it's interesting too, from a service level point of view, I bought a few cars recently. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it is amazing yeah. that in the, in the 30 years of one particular brand that I've bought, how the service level has dwindled. Oh yeah. yeah. And it's just amazing. So when they send that those, you know, they're all great about sending out customer service surveys, Yeah. right? Sometimes I say, do you really want me to fill this out? Yeah. Do you really want me to be honest? Yeah. Right? And what I also find is they don't upsell. They don't take your order, yeah. but they don't say, do you play golf? Or do you, you know, what do you do? And we can set up your boot in a different manner for you to suit, to suit that, right? A lot of that is gone. Mm. And so therefore our industry suffers that as well. Yep. We've actually suffered the same thing yeah. in the same form. So for those of you that are out here listening to James and I speaking today, the first thing you've got to do coming into the industry and you're new, you've got to make sure that your service level is better than anybody else's. 
And I always say it's better to be different than be better. And if you can be better on top of that, you're going to win. So the reality here today is we're going to take a break in a sec for a few minutes. But the reality here with this interview so far is that we are now been talking about service for the last 15 minutes on and off. And that's really what sets one individual apart from another one in this business. Yeah. And I think too, Michael, you know, I reckon when you speak to people and along their journey, I've I've made some great friends in this business, right? Um, And obviously you're one of them. But the reality is that I think if you can deliver a service that is, that you can make the client feel like you're a friend. Yeah. Like you genuinely and authentically care about them and don't sincerity selling. I call 100%. it. Yeah. Well, you can't fake authenticity, as I always say. Yeah. You can't fake that. Yeah. Whereas, People will know whether you're on or not. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. If, if they can, if they can trust you and, and feel comfortable with you, and to know that you're not treating them like another transaction, yeah. um, it's very difficult to do that if you've got a volume-based mentality or transactional-based mentality. Yes. And I understand transactions are important in this business. I Absolutely. get that. Yeah, yeah. But the consumer, the the, the person who you're dealing with they need to feel as though they are your only client. And you've got to make them, if you can make them feel as though you genuinely care about them and their personal situation, otherwise immerse yourself in their situation to understand yeah. what's happening, yeah. if they allow you to do that, it makes that whole experience completely different. Yes. It's funny, you know, You know, a lot of the talk lately has been around these American TV shows, yeah. Million Dollar Listing, etc. Now, as much as I love watching them, I've even got my kids... Yeah. watching them with me now, right? And and we have a bit of a laugh and a joke and all that sort of stuff. And I've done a little bit of work in the US training-wise. Yep. Right? And interestingly enough, that's giving a very unreal perception of where our business is at. Sure, agree with that. Right? And maybe that's the way it's edited. Mm. It doesn't show them always in a good light, mm. etc. cetera. Uh, but in the, in the overall scheme, this business is great to provide a high level of income, yep. to provide a high level of, of standard of living, and what I've found with that is, is that it's never the first time you deal with a client that wins for you financially. No. But when they come back a second and a third and a fourth time and you didn't have to go and, and fossick for the business, that's when you're making A, some good coin, and B, you provide the service with absolute glee. Yeah. Because you're getting remunerated for what you believe you're worth. Yeah. And there's nothing worse when you're not remunerated for what you think you're worth. Yeah. Because you... You don't do you don't do a good job of that, and that's and the other thing with that too now is that from a um, an advice point of view, I've also noticed that the market appraisals. You go and you look at a house, and you might think the house is worth two million dollars, and then Joe Boggs from around the corner tells them two point five to two point eight. That problem's been in since Jesus had short pants. Yep. that's always going to be here. <laughs> yep. right? it's, just, yep. it's there forever. Yep. The reality of that is though, people generally know when they've been hoodwinked or swindled. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. So therefore, this sincerity thing that you and I are talking about, when you talk to someone and you go, look, they're really not telling you the truth. Yeah. I can not in good conscience tell you that price. You know, as well as I, you know in, 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 inwardly that this is not right. Yeah. Right. When you do that and say to them, look, but if anyone's got a, a, a hope of getting a better dollar for you, it'll be me because I know the worth of the house. So my job is to get a little bit above that. But if I aim up there, I'm going to curb all my market. Yeah. I won't get all my market in. So yeah. I'm going to miss the people... Because people buy, and I think you'd agree with this, aspirationally. Yeah. So they always, if they can spend a million, they'll probably look at something at 1.2. Yep. You find that's the case? Yeah, 100%. Okay. So therefore, we need to sell aspirationally. And that's where a lot of the training gets back to the start, where the directors, generally very proficient listers and sellers and auctioneers, need to train the salespeople and understand the psyche of the public that we're dealing with. But they don't do it, Michael. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, and well, that's sad. That, that's actually quite, that, that's staggered me. Not that I've gone out there and trained 100 offices. I haven't done that. But the, the, the businesses that I've walked into recently over the last 12 months, it staggers me that these owners don't focus um, or train their biggest assets, which are their people. Yeah. It blows my mind away. And you, the, the reality of that is, getting back to what we said before, you don't need a large contingent of staff. No. Because one of the things I've found it's interesting, is is that a lot of directors won't go out and put out OFI boards before an auction in the morning. Yeah. They'd rather have a sleep in and then pay a cadet to do it. Yeah, That's fine. But you might only need one cadet. Some of them have got three or four cadets. Yeah. So you're paying out $120,000, $130,000. All it does is erode the bottom line. Yeah. So the director can sit, 
sleeping in the mornings. Yeah. I sort of don't get that much. Yeah, yeah, no. I look at that and go, okay. And the other reality of that is, is that the less of that that we do, the less contact we have with the client. Yeah. So it's sort of it's a self perpetuating problem. It just keeps going around. No doubt. So you know, I think in in the summation, um, in the summation of this right now, we'll we'll take a pause in a sec, John. But in the summation of this right now is is that you know boutique is good. There's probably some lessons for both of us in that. Yeah. Right. And keeping it tight and keeping it small and keeping your GP up and keeping it real. Yeah. All right. We'll take a break, John. <laughs>